Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here talking about this, my favourite subject. But we can start a long way north. So this is the Angel of the North. Remarkable structure, 25 metres tall, 60 metres wingspan, but really quite a simple structure. Although to make it might have been rather complex. And when we think about type 2 diabetes, often the words are trotted out that it's a complex heterogeneous condition. Now, this depends upon where you're coming from. But if you've been trying to unpick what's causing diabetes and you've drilled down into a narrow compartment to find out what all the details are, you may have a rather different view. In this slide, the background are all the biochemical pathways in the body. But we're not going to go into those details. What I'd like to do is to pick out just a few ideas that have been put forward to explain why insulin secretion in type 2 diabetes goes downhill. Maybe it's due to these gut hormones that we hear a lot about, or the death of the beta cell. That's often been said. A few years ago, a few decades ago, the idea of amyloid building up in the islet causing diabetes came to the fore, really on pretty small evidence, and that's receded. There's a matter akin to cell death, planned cell death. Maybe it's all the body just determining where it's going. Inflammation, genetic factors, so many things. But of course, type 2 diabetes isn't just about the beta cell. There's also the huge matter of resistance to insulin. And so a whole separate group of scientists have been plugging away at the effects of obesity, liver insulin resistance, Microbiome, there's a fashionable bandwagon. Muscle insulin resistance, insulin signaling, brain rate, it all seems very complex. But I've been working on various aspects of trying to understand what the body did with food. That seemed to be a pretty basic thing. Now, most of you here will have had your breakfast this morning, and you probably haven't even thought where it's heading just now. But I can tell you, by about 11 o'clock, about a third will be in your muscle and about a quarter will be in your liver as glycogen. And so we can actually track that. But of course, drilling down and asking simple questions leads to some other thoughts. And in 2006, a final piece of information landed in my lap that made me think that type 2 diabetes was a simple condition. It could be entirely explained by having too much fat in the liver and in the pancreas. That's it. And this would accord with what we know about populations. When does type 2 diabetes come on in populations? Well, it's when that population becomes affluent and is able to eat. How about the reverse? Well, we know from Cuba that had a horrible economic disaster in the 1990s that when food shortages occur, the incidence of type 2 diabetes plummets. And this isn't a new observation. In the 19th century, Claude Boucherday described it during the Siege of Paris. He said, the remarkable thing is, the sugar has disappeared from the urine of all my patients. Well, we don't want to mount a siege to get on top of type 2 diabetes, but let's just press a bit further. Because if this 2006 idea was right, we should be able to actually get type 2 diabetes back to normal by weight loss. And if we did that, we could follow the processes by which type 2 diabetes would have developed, but following them in reverse order. So that's where reversing type 2 diabetes comes from. And the twin cycle hypothesis that explained this was really very simple. It suggested that if people suddenly cut back on the food consumption, negative calorie balance, then the level of fat will go down in the liver and the pancreas. Now in the liver, our research over the previous eight or 10 years had shown that it was the amount of fat in the liver 
that determined how insulin resistant the liver was. In the pancreas, we only had reported animal evidence that if a pancreas was given fat, it stopped making insulin in response to glucose. So let's just imagine in the liver, decrease the fat, we would actually normalize the overnight blood sugar because the overnight blood sugar depends entirely upon insulin controlling glucose production from the liver. In the pancreas, we might be able to restore the normal response to insulin after a meal. So it's one thing having a hypothesis, but it's quite another thing testing it. Unfortunately, Diabetes UK funded the acid test, and I'll show you the results. If this hypothesis is right, fasting glucose will fall to normal really pretty fast. And this is what we found. I have to say, in a lifetime of testing hypotheses and trying to understand things, nothing else has been as dramatically clear as the results of the counterpoint study. Fasting glucose fell from just over nine to less than six in seven days. And it remained there during the eight weeks of the study. But because we were using special techniques based on magnetic resonance, a bit like MRI, but with a big group of physicists making the machine do clever things, we were able to understand the components of this. Because at seven days, liver fat had gone down 30%, and there was no insulin resistance. Now, this is quite different from most studies where people will tell you there was a significant improvement. This wasn't a significant improvement. This was normalization. Absolutely remarkable. Then, over eight weeks, the pancreas change was much slower. There was a gradual fall in the level of fat in the pancreas, and the beta cells woke up started responding almost normally to insulin. So the hypothesis seemed to be right. And immediately, I was precipitated from testing a, an idea, testing a hypothesis, to seeing if this would work in practice. Because the big question that everybody asked was, well, how about at the end of the eight weeks? Surely all this is going to vanish, and diabetes will come back when people stop having the diet they had, which was about 700 calories per day. It was designed to be acceptable and feasible. It had been designed on the basis of what my patients have been telling me over the previous uh, three or four decades. So it was a diet that was manageable, but very low in calories. So what happens when we stop that? Well, we needed to find out, and so we ran the next study which is called counterbalance. And I'll just show you the results of the liver fat, because that, that graph, I think, is very appealing and just tells the story. Here we see baseline liver fat. In type 2 diabetes, liver fat is horribly high. Normal is about 5%. Here we have over 13%. And after the diet, 10 weeks, it was entirely normal, 2%. Six months later, keeping weight steady, it was 2%. Now, there's a really important detail in this because the average BMI had dropped from 34 down to 30. Half of this group without diabetes was still obese. The other half were non-obese. Type 2 diabetes is almost nothing to do with obesity. Obesity is a fixed level cutoff of 30 that arbitrarily assigns people to a category. We're talking about an excess of fat because these people who dropped from, say, 40 down to 36 BMI remained just as normal as the people who dropped from 28 down to 24 BMI. But of course, this was only the first step. And we needed to move on from showing we could do this in a research center to, that's an interesting competition, we could do this in a research center. But the question is, 
could it be transferred The jumbo jets landed. Could it, could it be transferred to ordinary folk uh, being dealt with by the practice nurse or general practitioner? And so we designed the direct study, and this is work in conjunction with Professor Mike Lean in Glasgow, an expert on obesity. Diabetes UK actually turned down our separate applications and said, well, why not work together and do a really big study? And that's where direct comes from. So here we have the direct study. The idea was to randomize practices either to intervention, we're aiming for 15 kilograms weight loss. That was a weight loss in our first two studies. It's feasible and achievable with this simple pragmatic approach to losing weight. 15 kilograms weight loss and then keep it steady and there were 149 people in that group. The other group had best management according to guidelines. And of course, we've got plenty of guidelines to manage type 2 diabetes. We visited all the practices to make sure that they were actually being rolled out as well as possible. And what we found, basically, was that diabetes could be put into remission in ordinary primary care. I'm showing you the data at 12 months here, 12 months after stopping all the, all the tablets, and you'll see if people lost 15 kilograms or more, and a quarter of the whole group in primary care did so, then 86%, or you might say about 9 out of 10 people, were free of diabetes. Free of diabetes. If they lost less weight, it was less dramatic, and so on, so if they lost a trivial amount of weight, five kilograms, they remained diabetic. And overall, almost a half of the whole group, 46%, were free of diabetes at that time. So clearly, this is a feasible operation. What had happened in direct was that specialist dietitians who really understood the matter of what to eat and what not to eat, and the fact it's all about quantity, not fiddling with the and uh, the types of foodstuffs eaten. They trained the practice nurses in a structured training program that was, <clears throat> excuse me, eight hours training for the initial spell of the weight loss and return to normal eating. So this is feasible, this is doable. But that's the practice nurses. On the other hand, we have the really important people. We've got the folk with diabetes. So. What were they thinking and what problems were they coming across during this journey of losing weight rapidly over 12 weeks in direct and then keeping it off in the long term? Well, we had a team of psychologists led by Professor Falco Snehotter in Newcastle to actually interview the people, apply questionnaires and all the things psychologists do. And this is the timeline of the study. Uh, the initial motivation to volunteer, the adherence to this low-calorie diet, and then return to food. And Falco and team identified things that made it easier for people and barriers. You can imagine the sort of barriers there would have been. But I'll show you just a brief account of what Falco et al. found. Facilitators were positive behavior regulation strategies. So just setting yourself up to do various things. Avoidance of situations where food will be pressed upon you. Drinking water instead of having something to eat because you are thinking you needed it. Distraction. You could have a list of tasks that you were going to do around the house. I knew I had to fix a hinge on that door, but I keep forgetting. So you do that instead of having something to eat. Reminding yourself of the goals, you've written them down in advance. Why are you doing this? Well, you need to remind yourself. Clearing the cupboards of all the temptations, chocolates, crisps, biscuits, and recruiting help. Now, that's possibly the most important thing. Early on in our studies, I was a bit puzzled because I couldn't actually 
figure out who was going to respond well to this and who was going to respond badly. Now, that was a surprise to me because over decades of talking to people, listening to people, you pick up a feeling for how well people are likely to put into operation your advice. But with this, I had no clue. And then I discovered it wasn't the person. It was the spouse or partner or friend. Because in our long, day-long studies to do all these metabolic tests, people often brought up their spouse, partner, friend, and there was the answer sitting beside them. It was actually the support system that was really determinant. And there was an important one-way logic rule. If the spouse was not in favor of more logic, more weight loss, it would not happen. If the spouse was fully supportive, there was a good chance, but not 100%, that it would happen. So social disclosure, including those near to the person, as well as social circle at work, you know, why aren't you joining us in eating cake to celebrate every occasion? Well, people need to be upfront about this, and that's uncomfortable at first. Social disclosure. But down here are the barriers, <clears throat> and there are some emotional and cognitive barriers, life events and stress. Now, that's, that's difficult, because you can't stop sudden cataclysms, financial problems, house problems, family problems, but we were geared up for this in direct because we had, in advance, rescue plans lined up. So if people put on more than a certain amount of weight, they would go back to the liquid formula diet that we used and would gain and regain control. 50% of the whole diabetes, of the whole population in direct needed at least one rescue package. And that group that needed the rescues did just as well in the long term as the group that didn't. So this is life, this is real people. And we have to understand that putting on weight is not necessarily failure, it's a matter of appropriate action at the appropriate time and getting back down. Environmental barriers, well, they're tough, but we have to recognize presence of shops with food, especially attractive food stacked next to the checkout, Traveling can be a problem with those vending machines, and socializing a big problem, especially if buying rounds in the pub is part of your normal social life. For a spell during the weight loss, that's something that perhaps has to go, and that's tough. And finally, Lucia, the psychologist most closely connected with this, invented the term food robe. She was drawing in an analogy with where you put your clothes, your wardrobe. But your food robe is what you've got in your cupboards that you bought from the shops. So redesigning what you buy and put in the cupboards was really a, a very important step in moving from a simple weight loss program, people found much easier than they expected, to real life and keeping it down with real food that is much more difficult than people expected. So let's take a bird's eye view of the population. When the angel looks down on the population in the street, the angel might think, what a heterogeneous group of people. Some are bigger and some are small. Some are tall and some are short. Some walk fast, some walk slowly. Some look well-dressed, some don't. The background population is heterogeneous. No wonder. If we look at a group of people with type 2 diabetes, you'd say, well, that's a heterogeneous group of people. But it's the people that are heterogeneous, not the disease. The disease has just been applied on top of heterogeneity. Let me take just one example of this. The belief that people who are obese and have type 2 diabetes have a different cause for the disease than those who are non-obese and have type 2 diabetes. That is so ingrained in the literature. It appears in reviews, in casual articles. And so this statement, non-obese type 2, got a greater insulin secretion defect and less insulin resistance. Deserves great skepticism. And when we look hard at the literature, 
for studies that really nailed it and compared people with diabetes with people without diabetes at the same weight and matched, we find a different picture. And we've got to look a long way back to see these good studies. Jerry Reven, one of the giants of diabetes, showed that if you do a meal test on these matched groups of people, you get similar secretion, about two and a half fold rise in the non-obese, so these beta cells are actually pretty good, and 1.8 fold in the obese. That wasn't significantly different, but underscores the point. And also, insulin resistance. It was equivalent in matched groups, just slightly greater in the diabetic group, always, but the non-obese people were down here, the obese people were up there. The difference wasn't in obese, non-obese. It's really quite different. The difference was between diabetes and no diabetes. <clears throat> Let me take that a step further, because you'll be familiar with people coming into your consulting room, your surgery, and saying, why have I got type 2 diabetes? All my friends are fatter than me, and they don't have it. Well, let me try and explain. Let's just imagine a population distribution of body mass index, BMI. But instead of the usual smooth curve that comes out of epidemiological studies, let's put little blobs to represent individuals. So here's a pile of individuals, and the commonest BMI is 27. Now that happens to be about the background population of the UK just now. But in fact, this is a population distribution of UK PDS. How many of you knew that one third of people in UK PDS had a normal BMI, less than 25? It's an item that's disappeared from view. It, there's a tendency to assume that UK PDS was on the sort of people we see today, and it's not true. So this is back between 1977 and 1991, recruiting for UK PDS, and this is the distribution of individuals. Let's just park that at the top of a graph. Here they are, one distribution. And consider if they all lost 15 kilograms weight. Now, each blob is red, meaning that this person has diabetes. Let's just imagine they all lost 15 kilograms, the BMI would go down, and the blob would become yellow. But that's not good enough, because we need to understand the one person in front of you in your consultation. We only deal with one person at a time. We're all individuals. So let's just take three of these individuals. Here we've got Fred and Mary and Bill. Fred had diabetes, BMI about 38. So did Mary, so did Bill. But just look, he lost his diabetes in going to a BMI of three units less. Mary did the same. Here we are, 29 down to about 26. And so did Bill. They've all moved. Now, if we were to ask a population expert what had happened, they would say, well, nothing has happened because Fred is still obese, BMI over 30. Mary is still overweight, BMI over 25, less than 30. And Bill shouldn't have been losing weight anyway because he was non-obese. These barriers, these fixed definitions of obesity and normal are really inimical to looking after individuals. Because what's happened really is that each person has crossed their own personal fat threshold on the way from becoming diabetic to not. And there's the dotted lines that represent him. We can never know in advance where that threshold might be, but it will be crossed. Some people, for instance, have put on almost all the weight that they've lost and remain free of diabetes, but they put on the extra two kilograms, bang, it goes. Other people are free of diabetes, put on two or three kilograms, and it's back. So there's an uncertainty here, but we live with uncertainty in medicine. So here we have 
the personal fat threshold. And of all the concepts that have come out over the last few years, this is the one that, locks, that people lock onto. Your patients will understand this explanation and say, OK, I get it. So I'm just too heavy for my body. Yes, it's as simple as that. So let me tell you about one particular person who came along to see me very early on in this. BMI, normal, HbA1c, up on metformin, fasting glucose. This person was adamant that they did not want their diabetes. And so on the basis of our liver research, we hadn't done the rest at that stage, I suggested that this person lost a considerable amount of weight and tried to keep it steady. And they did. And this is what happened. Six months, BMI was 20. HbA1c was normal. Now, still on metformin at that stage, but stopped. BMI 19.4, 5.19.4 at 14 years. This person's now almost 15 years down the line with no diabetes, having kept the weight steady. Now, sitting there, you might say, but a BMI of 19.4, is that really safe? Well, of course it's safe. That's the BMI this person had in their early 20s. They're just built like that. My BMI has never been as ridiculously high as 19.4. So remember, individuals, they matter. And here's another individual. Jeff had had diabetes for about five years, and he was going down a familiar, miserable path. Inside that boot, it will surprise none of you to learn that there was a Charcot foot. Here we are, one Charcot foot. He weighed 126 kilograms, HbA1c was 9.2. But as is often the case, the problem is not with the Charcot foot, it's what's in this nice white shoe here, a syndrome of the other foot. That's the one that gets amputated, it's trying to do more work, it's left lying around the floor, and indeed, he'd suffered recurrent ulcers, severe cellulitis, it wasn't a happy position. He'd been told to expect amputation on the next admission. Now, his sons took him in hand and said, look, there must be some way out of this. And entirely empirically, they started trying to get him fit and lose weight by restricting what he ate. Then they heard about the Newcastle work. Jeff came up to Newcastle, and in 2014, he weighed 94 kilograms and his HbA1c was 6.2, still on metformin at that stage, and it was stopped. You might wonder what Jeff is like now, and it's pretty much like uh, 2017, when this picture was taken. He's gone back to what he loves doing, which is cycling. He's got two feet, which have normal skin overlying them. The Charcot deformity, of course, is still there, but the feet healed up, these non-healing ulcers healed over about two years. This is not a fast process. And he's very pleased to have repaired his puncture. His face may look familiar to some of you because this is Jeff Whittington from Fixing Dad. And this book was written by his daughter-in-law and his two sons are film producers. If you want to understand what it's like to live with someone undergoing this, and understand the emotional landscape on which that happens. Have a look at Fixing Dad. It's one of the most graphic and gripping films. It made me feel quite choky at the end. So, why bother with all of this? Well, we can list some benefits. Feeling 10 years younger. We started off trying to understand type 2 diabetes. We inadvertently stumbled upon the elixir of eternal youth. Losing the diabetic label. He's diabetic. That diabetic over there. It's a terrible thing. People feel it vividly. No tablets, injections. Long-term outlook better. People love sitting in your waiting room. No excess insurance costs. Holiday insurance for people with diabetes, 50% more than anyone else. So this is Alan who's spoken out about this. He was one of our original counterpoint volunteers, still free of diabetes. And the black shirt here is significant. 
because this is the black shirt that's lain in his drawers for 20 years or so because he used to go discoing in this shirt and he is so pleased to fit back into it. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Type 2 diabetes is a simple disease. Here we have the pathway, increased liver fat causing too much export of fat from the liver. The pancreas fat builds up and damages the beta cells. But lose the weight, liver fat goes down, export down, pancreas fat down. The beta cells can recover in some people. I haven't talked about duration, but the shorter the duration, the more likely a complete recovery. Over 10 years of diabetes, it's much less likely. But critically, type 2 diabetes is reversible, and we can study that phenomenon. So remission can be achieved. And that takes us back to our angel on the hillside. And the thing about an angel is you can ask them questions. And so you might turn to the angel and say, what is type 2 diabetes? And the angel might reply, type 2 diabetes is a simple state of having more fat than the individual can tolerate. Thank you. Thank you, Roy, for that elegant talk and challenging the way we think about diabetes and also making us believe that it has real application in day-to-day -day care of the patients we all provide. So thank you very much. We are running a bit late, but I think I'll allow a couple of questions, um, burning questions. Please state who you are, if you remember, and where you work, if you're in a job. And, uh, and uh, so over to you. The question in the back in the, in the middle. Um, thank you, that was really a very interesting talk. Um, I just wanted to ask, I get patients like even for pre-diabetes and the lady for, I had a few in fact, their PMIs is rather more like 21, 22 and it's like 46 the HbA1c. And um, they're obviously very devastated because they do a lot of exercise, eating all the right foods. Is there still hope for them too? Do they have to take it even further down? Or what's, what advice can we give? Because I'm a little bit at loss there. With those lower range BMIs, we have to be a bit cautious because if we look at that low BMI population, and we're studying this at the moment, you'll find that it has an enriched population of people with MODI and people with slow onset type 1. So we've got to be really careful uh, that we don't mislabel. Now, diagnosis is difficult, but for those people, I would advise sending off islet antibodies to a lab that does the full proper tests. Send off Modi uh, screen for the genes in Exeter uh, if that seems appropriate, if there's a family history that doesn't skip a generation. So, first of all, diagnosis. We've got to be careful we're talking about type 2 diabetes. But especially if that person is uh, Asian or Far Eastern ethnicity, then a BMI of 21, they should lose weight. BMI of 21 for the, for the rest of the population, maybe, but really we have to assess each person individually. I think it's very reasonable to look and see. If this is the case, then a week of severe food restriction will see glucose plummet to normal. If not, then it's something else. One, one question on the far end, and the final question here. Can we get the microphone? Hi there. Thanks for the lovely talk. Uh, I'm a GP from Wimbledon. Um, just wanted to ask you about if there will be a role of statins in reducing the cholesterol and uh, indirectly affecting the liver and the pancreas. And um, uh, how about patients who have got hyperlipidemia? Are, is there a link with hyperlipidemia, deposition of fat in the pancreas, and diabetes? Thank you very much. Okay. So that's a slightly complicated question. Uh, statins, as you know, may bring, precipitate type 2 diabetes, which is a curious thing uh, in people on the edge of diabetes. It seems that the actual particle composition is different and this is something we don't understand. People with hyperlipidemia 
uh, again in a different category. People may have triglycerides of 10, 12, be at risk of pancreatitis, and yet they don't have diabetes. It's the wrong kind. That's not got the, the apolipoprotein label on that delivers it to the pancreas. So you can measure the triglycerides and see it very high, and yet it doesn't actually have the same meaning. And it's probably because of this that epidemiological studies have not fingered triglyceride as being important. It's just a slightly complicated subject because of the different subclasses. A question here at the front. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed your fantastic talk. Uh, just a curious question. You know, the, your hypothesis uh, says it is all related to the fat excess in the liver and in the pancreas. And so the basic defect, according to you, would be a decrease in the beta cell function. Is that what you're proposing as uh, the uh, causation of type 2 diabetes? Because if you simplify yep. the whole algorithm, then it boils down to beta cell. So just a curious thing to know. Did you check their beta cell functions when they remitted? You know, when they had diabetes yep. in remission? And do you think it uh, compared the same as with the controls without diabetes? Yes. When we measure the first phase insulin response, which is small squirt of glucose, just to raise glucose about three millimole per litre, then at baseline, there's no first phase response. Over the eight weeks, we saw the pancreas wake up and go almost back to normal. Now in direct, with the people in Newcastle, we were able to study that in great detail. Uh, we have published the results showing the first phase comes back, not entirely to normal, and that's fine, Actually, the total capacity of beta cells goes back to normal, complete normality, because of what we now understand about the mechanisms. It seems that the beta cell is not dead. It's there. It's just stopped producing insulin. And of course, if you do a pancreas stain and look for insulin-producing cells, you don't see them. You assume they're dead. But in fact, they are there. They've just lost the specialist function. Take away the metabolic stress bang, the specialist function comes back. So yes, beta cells recover. Thank you very much, Roy. We move on to part two of... Uh...